Good evening friends, uh, I am your host Piali and I welcome you all to the webinar. Today I have uh, Ms. Pia Maria Thorian with me. Pia Maria is the founder and owner of Green Bullet Solutions. She is a specialized in uh, people management, agile HR and leadership. Pia Maria is also the author of Agile People, a radical approach for HR and managers. Today's webinar is named after her best-selling book, Agile People, where she will tell us uh, how to create a structure and culture for an organization to meet future challenges and empower employees to become motivated stakeholders. It's a one-hour session. You can post or type your queries in the question box. Towards the end of the session, Pia Maria will address those queries. So now I will request Pia Maria to start her presentation and take the show forward. Over to you, Pia Maria. Thank you, Pia Ali, for giving me this opportunity to share uh, what I have learned during the years as a consultant with you. Um, I am passionate about creating engagement and motivation using Agile uh, and uh, today I will talk about why the dinosaurs died, why we cannot go on like before and what HR needs to do to speed up this process. Do you recognize this old man? Uh, well, I guess you do because it's Charles Darwin and he was known for being the author of a book called On the Origin of Species. But he also had a saying, survival of the fittest. And you might believe that he said that the strongest survive. But was this really what he meant? No. What did he really mean? He meant that the species that can adjust and adapt to changing circumstances are the species animals or plants that survive and that will continue to thrive. The ones that don't will die. And the same goes for our organizations. So the dinosaurs, they were very big and very strong, but they died because they did not have the ability to adapt to the changing environment. We don't want to do the same mistake in our companies. We have the knowledge how to continuously handle change in a complex world. And that is through agile ways of working. And that's why we need to move to agile ways of working. So let's start by looking at the workplace from eight to years ago. And this is the ironing department. Today, these women are replaced with robots. Uh, and on this time, it was about doing the same thing over and over and over again. And the challenge was to make the flows as effective as possible and to standardize processes. The women on this picture had no say in how things should be done. That was carefully thought out by a few people in the top. They were just doing what they were chosen to do. And this is another picture from about the same time from a Ford factory. People were indeed part of a machinery on this time. Scientific management, also called Taylorism, was a theory of management that analyzed workflows. And its main objective was improving economic efficiency, especially labor productivity. And it was one of the earliest attempts to apply science to engineering of processes and to management. And it was highly effective for meeting challenges of that time, uh, which was mainly about industrial manufacturing and logistics. So they built management systems of standardization to create efficiency at the production line. So uh, this is what Henry Ford said, thinking is the hardest work there is, which is probably the reason why so few engage in it. And it says something about the way he viewed people. A few people in the top created structures of micromanagement that flows top down. Uh, this is another person uh, who was highly influential in the end of the 50s, beginning of 1960s. He wrote a book called The Human Side of Enterprise, and it's Douglas MacGregor. In that book, he wrote about the human theory of X and Y, 
And that's the theory about how the human mind works. And I would like to share that with you. Um, if you believe in theory X, you think that people dislike to work, you f they find it boring and will avoid it. But if you believe in theory Y, you think that people need to work and want to, to do it. And if they have the right conditions, they would like doing it. If you believe in theory X, you think that people must be forced or bribed to make a right effort. But if you think if you believe in Y, you think that people will direct themselves towards goals that they accept and that they have been there to put themselves, not getting them in the head from above somewhere. When it comes to responsibility, you think with the X view that people would rather be directed than accept responsibility, which they would avoid. But if you believe in Y, you think that people will seek and accept responsibility if they have the right prerequisites. About motivation, you, you think with the X view that people are motivated mainly by money or fear about losing their jobs. But with a Y view, you think if people get the prerequisites and right conditions and get uh, the ownership of, of stuff themselves, people are motivated by the desires to realize their own potential. And finally, about creativity, if you believe in X, you think that people have a, a very little creativity, except when it comes to gaming the system or getting around rules. But with the Y view, you think that everybody is extremely creative, but we are not using the creativity enough in people's minds. So you could think about where are you? Are you an X person or are you a Y person? Um, that's quite interesting to think about. And I would say that most people, when you ask them, they say that they are a Y person. And then we could think that <clears throat> it might only be a prejudice that we have about other people, that they are X people. And what if we, when we believe that they are X people, we create those X people. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So what is agile? Well, you could ask yourself if, if uh, you have to be able to do this to be agile. Because if you, uh, if you see the, the, what it means, it means nimble or it means quick or flexible. It's about adaptability. It's to be able to adapt to change. And agile appeared first in the software development industry as a reaction against the waterfall method. And we think we can control reality and make a fantastic plan, but it turns out that reality looks a lot different than we thought in the future. The problem is that we need feedback from reality all the time to be able to make the right decisions uh, and choose the right road forward. So instead, you could say that in Agile, you accept reality the way it looks like, and you adapt to it instead of trying to make a perfect plan that will not happen anyway. Uh, the Agile Manifesto was developed in the beginning of 2000 as, some, uh, as a reaction to all the problems that you saw with more traditional models. In um, Agile, the people are the most important. And if the team doesn't work, it will not work to produce uh, good stuff together from that team. And there are four principles in the Agile uh, Manifesto. Uh, individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Working software over comprehensive documentation. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. And responding to change over following a plan. So uh, we don't say that there is no value uh, on the items uh, on, on the right, but we value the items on the left more if we have to choose. Um, nowadays, it's 2018, and the principles of the manifesto today apply to all of the organization, not just to IT. So uh, Joshua Kurevsky, who is the CEO of Industrial Logics, says that the Agile Manifesto was great in 2001 when it was first drafted. But as Agile has evolved and changed, 
those principles have become outdated. So he has done a new uh, suggestion, which contains uh, four principles. Uh, and those are, the first one is make people awesome. And by that, he doesn't mean just the employees or just the customers. It's the suppliers, it's the government, it's the society around the companies. Every person who come in contact with the company. Uh, the second one is deliver value continuously. And we all know that va uh, value uh, is the most important thing in Agile, to be able to deliver value to a customer. Make safety a prerequisite. It's also an important cornerstone. And it's not just about physical safety. It's also about psychological safety. And we will talk more about phys uh, psychological safety later in this presentation. And it's also about experimenting and learning rapidly, because continuous learning and continuous improvement is a core value in Agile. So I'm going to tell you um, some news. You are not in business to make money. What is she saying, you're wondering now? Are we not in business to make money? No, you are not in business to make money. You are in business to create value for a customer, internal or external. And when you do that, value will follow. But we can never focus on the money first. We have to first focus on the value. And when we do that, we will become profitable and the shareholders will get their part in the end. So value comes first, profit follows. The agile principles that we need to work with in all companies are, among others, the most important, I have listed them here on this slide, trust, transparency, de delegated responsibility and decision-making, self-organizing teams, trial and error, experiment and fail fast, sustainable pace, continuous improvement and learning, and visualization. And of course, last but not least, customer value is always key. So in an agile organization, you need to put people and interactions uh, between people first. And you need to manage the flow to avoid sub-optimizing instead of optimizing for the whole. Uh, it's about always learning and improving in an ever-changing reality. And it's about creating value for customers and, and the stuff we do that does not really bring uh, any increased value. We see that as waste, and this is supposed to be minimized. So what are then the agile advantages? Well, uh, it's about having much shorter feedback loops uh, because we want feedback continuously from customers. It means decreased risk and increased learning. It's about faster results and shorter lead times. It's about better communication and self-management uh, because increased responsibility means that people will be more engaged. So what could be, um, if we compare Agile versus traditional, there are some things that uh, are different. It's the visibility of the project. Instead of being very visible in the beginning and the end, there is a high visibility uh through all the projects the risk is lower in agile projects uh, and the business value is delivered from the first sp sprint in the form of a minimum viable project um when about agile ways of working we don't follow recipes there are no recipes there are no best solutions of what always works we know that when you stick to certain principles rather than rules, fixed rules, it works well. So rules have a tendency to become too many and too prescriptive for them to work. The principles, on the other hand, are much more stretchable. And you can choose to what degree you should try and apply them to the organization. So principles are key. That's why we prefer to work with principle as the basics, and then you can use different tools to make them come alive. But that's no guarantee that the tools will work. We need to add a good dose of agile culture and the right mindset. Many organizations, for example, are working with Scrum in a, in a wrong way. 
So the mo most important ch changes and shifts that our organizations need to go through is to make this mindset shift from profit to purpose, from hierarchies to networks, from controlling people to empowering people and giving them ownership, from planning to experimentation and from privacy to transparency. And it's about creating a balance in the organization between uh, the culture on the on one hand and the structure on the other hand. And also from an individual perspective, it's about creating the balance between your intrinsic motives and the basic desires. Those are the things that we cannot see from the outside and the, the external things, the things that are visible on people like behavior, skills, knowledge and competence. So we need to balance this. We also um, need to, to, to make sure that uh, the people that we hire also think that our cultural values are interesting and that they buy into them because otherwise they will not be happy in the organization. So you need to have balance on many different ways in this figure, which I call the four organizational windows. So what happens when you try to implement Agile in a large company, for example, it's that you, you try to change the culture and the values and the norms without removing uh, the hindering structures and systems and processes and tools. And then what you do is you create imbalance in the organization. And that's why so many agile transformation projects fail. So uh, this is a little funny um, picture. The problem with organizing, I think, is that pretty soon folks will be paying more attention to the organization than to what they are organized for. And this is what happens when we grow as a company, when bureaucracy takes over and you are starting to administer administration instead of creating value for a customer. We call this the bureaucracy trap. Uh, yeah, Pia Maria, Pia Maria, I'm sorry to disturb you. Actually, people are saying yeah. you can see the presentation in a very small mode. Like, can you make it just a full screen? Yeah, it's 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 better now. Okay, so you are. Um, I would like to do like this in that case. Yeah, that would be great. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so, to be engaged, uh, you really need to have both employee satisfaction and organizational contribution. It's about to have high values on employee satisfaction and organizational contribution. If you just have one, for example, if you only have employee satisfaction, people are really happy, but they are not really producing any value for the organization. And the other way around, if you have very high values on organizational contribution, you're hitting your results every month, you are a crash and burner. So you need both to be engaged. That's our definition of engagement. And when we have engaged employees, they will make sure that we also have happy customers and a profitable company and that we can realize the dream. And this, then we create those good, nice, circles that will strengthen each other. Jürgen Appelow, who is the father of Management Trio, he says that leadership is too important to be left uh, to the managers. Uh, so we should, managers should run the why, they should decide about the why, but that, and that is uh, uh, what is important for, for management to think about, but they should leave the how to the team to decide about. Uh, the intent of, of tools and methods uh, that are labeled agile is to create an organization where, where everybody is responsible. And in an agile organization, people will take ownership, not just for what they do every day, but also for the whole company as well. So we don't say you are responsible, but we acknowledge that we are all responsible for the success of the company. And it takes quite a big mind shift to, to understand this. Uh, a very important concept in Agile is self-organizing. 
So did you think about that birds and fish, they self-organize when they fly together? There is no leader and everybody is working together and just know how they should be flying and when they should turn and, and change direction. So it's, it's really fantastic to see, I think. And this ability to self-organize is within every person. And when you let people come together and they have a very clear why they can self-organize around how uh, without anybody has described exactly how to do it. So you leave the how to the team. And what's needed for a team to be able to self-organize is clear boundaries, clear constraints and rules, and a very clear goal, uh, target. So agile leadership is a lot like gardening. Uh, I like very much the gardening metaphor for leadership. Um, you could say that agile leadership is a brain-friendly leadership. We can't make that seed grow. We can try and keep our fingers crossed, but you still won't make the seed grow. What we can do is to give it good soil, sunshine, water. We can remove all the weeds, and then we can just hope that the seed will grow. And if it doesn't grow, in spite of we think we have done everything right, then we have to realize that either this seed doesn't grow in this environment, maybe it's the wrong soil, maybe it only grows in South Africa, or there is something wrong inside the seed. It could be a bad seed. And in that case, we need to help the seed to get well uh, or help the seed out of the organization. This is an image of agile leadership when it's at its best. So you don't buy a burrito for the bread, you buy it for the filling, because that's where all the taste is, the beautiful, colorful filling. The bread should just give enough structure to keep the filling from falling apart. And the bread here is representing leadership. And so about agile leadership, I think it's time to learn how to lead for real. And for all those leaders out there, it's time to get off the rocking horse. It's not difficult to lead when everybody's just following the rule book. And it's about breaking down goals from above, giving detailed instructions, and follow up according to predetermined templates. It's much more difficult to lead for real when you have to convince people, you have to sell your leadership to the team, and you have to become a manager that makes the team go in the right direction of their own free will and with engagement and motivation. So I would say that real leadership is about motivating the team to go in the direction that you want them to go in because they want to go in that direction. So what many managers think make knowledge workers productive are, for example, clear rules or bonuses or fear or career ladders or exclusivity, when in fact, what really matters for knowledge workers is autonomy, recognition, collaboration and mastery and trust and learning. And the only thing that is in common here is a decent salary. Everybody wants a decent salary. But most important for a leader in an organization is to be one with the organizational values and the culture. Here I think we, that, that is uh, non-negotiable, I think. Uh, a leader who is a good leader for an organization really believe in the values of, of the organization. What about HR? Well, now we are not so flexible anymore since HR has mapped up their processes. This was a comment from one of our customers uh, that we worked with in a large company. And this is actually what many people think about HR, that they are mapping up rigid, processes that are inflexible and they are policing the organization. 
So instead of falling in this trap that we have to have one HR, I've been in numerous one HR projects that never worked because it doesn't work that way, right? We can't have one HR. People are different, countries are different, different departments need different support. So we need to have different kinds of HR depending on where we are in the organization. Instead of this focus on control and alignment that we have had in the past, we need to focus on speed, customers, adaptability, and innovation for HR. And instead of implementing those control standards and systems to drive alignment, we need to focus on implementing programs and strategies that foster collaboration, expertise, and decision making. And if we look at what principles we need to change, uh, on this side, we have the traditional uh, role that the HR has taken in the past. And on this side, we have the more agile way of working. You are somewhere on this scale. Either you are very much traditional or you are very much agile. So from developing policies, rules, and standards to focusing more on supporting support, flexibility, speed, and collaboration for the whole organization, from delivering programs, processes to customers, to involving the customer in delivery, to involving the managers and the employees in the production of the HR deliverables. From focusing on having people who are HR specialists or generalists or administrators, we are moving towards more T-shaped HR people who can take many different roles, many different HR roles, and working more collaborative together. From individual work to teamwork, from functional HR and specialist areas to value stream-based HR, from jobs and positions to playing many different roles for employees, from HR projects to stable, high-performing teams, from promotions and bonus programs to salary formulas and profit sharing. They can also be performance related, of course. From delivering programs and processes to supporting the organization to perform, and from one size fits all to no size fits all. From having the HR recipe to experimentation, and from human view X to human view Y. I think that HR has a very important role to play in agile transformations. And they have been sitting in the back seat for too long, and it's time to step up and show what HR can do really for the organization. Because it's all about the people and the system in which the people even work. If we can give the right prerequisites to the people, they will take care of the rest. And we don't need to do more things. We need to learn how to stop hindering people from giving their best effort to the company by providing the wrong structures. And HR has the power to decide on these structures, uh, which can support people to perform or make it more difficult to contribute in creative and innovative manners. And those uh, uh, structures are change management, uh, organizational development, leadership programs, people development, talent acquisitions, and, and so on. So uh, instead, HR could provide um, more agile ways of working. And that's why HR needs to go first. And here is the opportunity to really make a difference for the organization. Uh, this is the manifesto for agile HR development. And you can go and have a look at it uh, on this um, address, agilehrmanifesto.org. Uh, it's followed by 12 principles on how to work together in the future for HR. And I've been helping out in uh, producing this agile HR manifesto. What about job descriptions? Well, um, instead of closing people into 
job descriptions, like closing people into boxes. We should let people be more free and be there to really follow their own uh, feeling, uh, what they can do, what can they contribute with for, uh, to the organization. You should instead maybe work with expectations on people. And people have many different roles in an organization. They have one professional role, maybe the main role. They also have a role in the team. They have a role for innovation. They also have a role for uh, the organization as a whole. And they have a role to develop themselves, to be their best uh, selves and uh, become more and grow as people. So people have many different roles, not just one. That's why we also need to work more with developing the competence in, in the form of a T, or a, I've also heard um, the further development of this model is to work with a pie, pie shaped competence with many depths. And that means that uh, I have a broad base, a general base. I'm familiar with a lot of things, but I am a specialist in one or several things. So I, I have a um, we, we try to make people specialized generalists or generalized specialists instead of just knowing one thing or being able to do one thing in the organization. About uh, goals and vision and performance, there is a reason why Martin Luther King said that I have a dream. He didn't say I have a five-year plan. Why didn't he say that? because everybody loves a beautiful dream. And a beautiful dream can unite a team, a department, and a whole company. And people can do the most boring things if they have a dream at the top that they buy into. For example, look at these two guys. One of them is cutting stone. The other one is building a cathedral. So the importance of perspective is really great. Um, can you see the bigger picture of what you are working or, on? Or are you just cutting stone? So there is a huge difference in engagement between the two ways of seeing things. The person who sees the whole picture will feel better and more engaged, and the whole cathedral will benefit from that. So performance management is about having a common direction. Instead of running in many different ways, people should, should go in the same direction, towards the vision, towards the dream, and that will be the force in all people's uh, common effort. And it becomes very um, then um, clear uh, and, and the results become very much higher if, if everybody's going in the same direction. A very common performance management model looks like this. You start by setting some goals for the new year. You work on completing the annual goals during the year then you have a major review in June and then you continue on completing the goals and then you have a follow-up and the performance appraisal in the towards the end of the year so there is a lot of different problems with this performance management cycle first a year is too long when the environment is changing faster we need to be able to change our goals much more than once a year. There is no proactivity in this uh, uh, model. We are only focusing on judging the past. And we could ask ourselves, does the boss really know best about how we have performed during the year? Or do our peers know maybe better? Maybe they should have a say in how good we have performed. Also, it's connected to salary. Uh, which leads to conflicts between uh, top management want us to have as high goals as possible and people want to set their goals as low as possible because they want to get their bonuses. It, it uh, breeds sub-optimizing sub and competition and not cooperation and we focus on results and getting our bonuses not on the good behaviors that could really make a difference in the organization. But then you might say, what should we do instead? And that's what HR asks me all the time. Well, there is a 
other ways of working uh, with, with performance management. And one such way is objectives and key results used by, for example, big tech companies like Google and Spotify and LinkedIn. Um, really good way of working with uh, performance management. We don't have time to go through that here today, uh, but um, I, I'm going through that in detail in my Agile HR certification course, how to work with objectives and key results. Uh, so what's the most important thing in an organization? I've been a consultant for 25 years. I've been thinking a lot about what is the most important thing. If I only could do one thing, what would I do then? Well, I think that it would be psychological safety. I think psychological safety would be the most important thing by far. And why do I think so? Well, let me tell you some stories about psychological safety. Sometimes we're just sitting quietly and we don't speak up and ask the question that we have in our head because everyone else is sitting quietly even if there is a question in the air that needs to be answered. So most of the time we are too busy managing impressions instead of saying what we really think or asking the questions we need answers to. But you think, I'll figure it out later. There are many situations where if people felt psychologically safe and asked the right questions, mistakes could be avoided. And sometimes, we don't tell others about our great ideas because we think that they may be perceived in a negative way when in fact somebody is really looking for a new solution to solve problem. And we are sometimes afraid to look incompetent in spite of our superior knowledge about the specific situation. And in this case, the nurse here has a piece of information that the doctor is missing. She knows that the patient is not feeling good getting the, the dose of medicine that the doctor has prescribed, but she doesn't say anything because last time she spoke up, he said that she was incompetent. So the fact is that nobody wants to go to work and look stupid or incompetent. We all want to look smart and helpful at work. And we don't speak up if there is a chance that we will be backstabbed or a chance that what we say will be misinterpreted. And it's really easy to manage. Don't ask questions. Don't admit weakness or mistake. Don't offer new ideas. And don't critique the status quo. So what do we need to do instead? To break that barrier, we all have to be brave and go first. And then we open up for others to do the same thing. Ask that question that you need the answer to. Tell people about your ideas. Psychological safety is a belief that one will not be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, or mistakes. Inform people about your observations. It could, in some cases, save lives. So when the workplace feels challenging, but not threatening, teams can sustain that broaden and build mode and oxytocin levels in our brains rise, eliciting trust and trust-making behaviors. This is a huge factor in team success. But who am I to speak about this, you may wonder. Is there really any evidence that proves that psychological safety is really the most important thing? Well, let's start with the research made by Susan Whelan, who is a psychology professor from Temple University in the US. She's been studying group processes and came to the conclusion that in an immature team, the questions that you ask yourself will become an obstacle to perform. You focus on your appearance and whether you are accepted or not, instead of focusing on productive work. Social group processes take over too much of people's attention so that you, you focus less on productive work. A mature team will focus most of the time on productive work instead of thinking about their power position or competing with other team members. Let's continue with the Agile Manifesto rather the new version of the Agile Manifesto. 
uh, make safety prerequisite concerns not only physical safety but also mainly psychological safety. Also, the third example I wanted to highlight here is from Google. They made this massive two-year study on what makes teams successful, and this project was called Aristotle. Of the five key dynamics of effective teams that the researchers identified, psychological safety was by far the most important. So the Google researchers found that individuals on teams with higher psychological safety are less likely to leave Google. They're more likely to harness the power of diverse ideas from their teammates. They bring in more revenue and they are rated as effective twice as often by executives. So at first they thought that if they put very competent people on the team, they would form the most successful team, but it turned to be completely wrong. Instead, it was all about the interactions and relationships between the team members of the team that mattered. If that safety was not there, the rest didn't seem to matter that much. So you can think about this question. Uh, have you ever held back from sharing anything at work? Something you were working on, an idea you had, a complaint or something, because you were worried about how people might react to it? We are not going to do that exercise now, but you can think about that. Some more from the Google study was also that when you spend some of the time talking about private things, instead of thinking that you can optimize by only talking job, team members get closer to one another and tend to produce better stuff together. And the output increases from the team. And the next, the last example I want to bring up is Professor Amy C. Edmondson from Harvard Business School. She conducted important research into psychological safety, and she was actually the one who coined the term from the beginning. Her research shows interesting stuff about people's learning ability, uh, and, and the higher the degree of psychological safety and motivation and accountability, the higher the degree of learning is in the workplace. So how do you then build psychological safety if you are a manager? How do you create an environment where people feel free to speak up and admit errors and mistakes so that everyone can learn from them? Well, you need to go first as a manager. You need to be vulnerable. We can't know what will happen. And we need everybody's brains to try to figure out the best way forward. You must acknowledge your own fallibility. You are not perfect as a manager. So you need to create this necessary safe place for speaking up when something is not right. Ask a lot of questions to show that you don't have all the answers. And if you do these things, you can maximize your learning by making it okay for people to ask questions before and after they make mistakes, preferably before so that the entire organization can learn faster, which is the goal. In a psychologically safe workplace, good performance is acknowledged and strengthened. And we can try and fail, and it's okay, because in the end, we will learn. If we become afraid of making mistakes, blame others for them, we are less likely to share different views and we can become victims of the common knowledge effect. The common knowledge effect demonstrates that one irrelevant factor, the number of members who know a particular piece of information can affect group decisions. If we instead can admit mistakes, learn from failure and share ideas, we will also innovate better and make better decisions. So in the future, the only competitive advantage that remains is knowledge, continuous learning, and innovation. The company that learns the fastest and transforms that learning into new products and services that the customers want and need will have that competitive advantage. And psychologically safe workplaces provide the platform from which continuous experimentation 
and learning can take place. Planning is not waiting for readiness. It is now 2018, so you cannot anymore make excuses like it's not the right time, it's too early, it's not the right time, it's too late, or we don't have the authority, or we don't have the resources, or it won't work, or we are too small, we are too big, it's not up to us, we need to wait until others join in, we are not ready. It's not get ready then act, it's act, you'll see how ready you were. So don't be a dinosaur. Read my book and get the knowledge you need to survive. No. That's what I want to share with you today. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. And uh, I would also like to say that I have this Agile HR certification training. I have some online uh, possibilities for that as well, for people who cannot travel. And then I would like to see here if we have any questions in the chat. Um, so I'll just move out from the presentation and see if I can open open up the chat here. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, just see. Let me see the question box if we have uh, something here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So here we have the first question. Uh, what are some of the programs run by HR in order to shift the mindset to adopt Agile? Yes. So I'm running this uh, Agile HR certification with IC Agile. And it's called ICP TAL. So you become certified uh, professional practitioner of um, Agile talent and Agile HR. And this is really important if you want to shift mindset because culture is the most difficult thing to, to change in an organization. Culture is like an organization's shadow. It's there, but you cannot really touch it. So culture is decided by all the behaviors that people are showing in the organization. So the only way to change a culture is to change the behaviors of people. And if you change more than 50% of people's behaviors, then you will change the culture. Um, so the root here is that leaders and HR needs to go first and change behaviors first. Then they will show the way for everybody else in the organization to do so as well. I don't know if I answered your question. I hope so. Uh, yes. So uh, like what I understand, HR and leader, they should uh, set an example first and then the other people can follow and uh, like uh, add exactly. on those uh, things. Yes. Uh, yeah. So moving on to the next question. From HR perspective, how much weightage is given to the certification while hiring an agile expert? Uh, again, what was the question? How much? Uh, can, how, how can you repeat the question, Piali? Yeah. How much weightage is given to the certification while hiring an agile expert? How much weighting? Yeah, uh, like uh, I think uh, he, he wants to ask if I have uh, some Agile certification, uh -huh. so how priority I will have while I'm uh, facing an interview or you are hiring me as an Agile expert? How much clarity will you have? Um, well, it's really, I think it's a lot up to yourself, really. Uh, if you have uh, a certification, you will have the insight in what you need to change, right? Uh, what does the change look like? And what is the vision that you need to move towards? And you will have the tools to do so. You will also have uh, the principles that you need to increase. Um, 
but then it's really up to um, the people in the organization and you have to know how to motivate them to change. So motivation is something that I work with a lot. Uh, and it, it, it's rooted in the basic needs and the basic psychological needs of people, the basic desires that people have. It's different for everybody. And if you know what makes the people do what they do, if you know what makes people tick, then you can also uh, help them to, to change in the right direction by giving them prerequisites, by giving them what they need, the tools they need, and, and uh, the knowledge they need to be able to, to change mindset and culture. Okay, okay, yeah. So uh, I'm moving to the next one. Next we have, uh, should the development teams be first moved to agile or the supporting functions like HR, marketing, etc.? Um, I think leadership and HR are the most important parts because if you have those structures, you need to remove the hindering structures and HR is holding on to so many of those. It's also finance really. Finance and HR have the most structures in organizations that are hindering the mindset change. These are old ways of working, old processes, old systems. Um, and this is what we need to let go to be able to change towards more agile ways of working and, and uh, the agile mindset. And then you can continue with marketing and all the other uh, departments as well become agile. But leadership and HR and finance also. I don't know if you heard about beyond budgeting the Beyond Budgeting Movement with Bjarte Bugsnes is really should, should be um, something that you do at the same time as uh, changing HR. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, moving on to the next question. Next, we have, uh, what are some of the different fun ways of retrospective meetings that can be conducted to engage teams? Uh, retrospectives is a great way to improve uh, teamwork and you can work with individual retros retrospective or team retrospectives or uh, you know other kinds of retrospectives it's always good to to make a retrospective because then you know that you are giving a chance to the organization to improve and change and do better in the future reflect on what have we been doing good, what have we been uh, doing not so good, what can we improve to the next period, and what shall we change for the next period. So uh, what shall we uh, continue doing, what shall we stop doing, and what shall we start doing? Those are the th three questions that I usually ask in a retrospective meeting. And they should be done regularly, at least once a month, for all different kinds of, of uh, departments or projects, in my opinion. Very interesting questions. Those, those will help to look back, actually, what, what we are doing and what have helped us and what we can improve. Yes. Yeah, very nice questions. Mm -hmm. So next mm -hmm. question we have here, uh, is it advisable to follow Agile in a small company also? Uh, say, for example, 10 person in a company. Definitely, definitely. It's much, much easier in a small company to go Agile than in a large company. Because you don't have so much bureaucracy, you don't have so many processes and systems and, and things that are, uh, hinder you. So it's very, very easy to work with the agile mindset um, and culture in a small business. And I would really recommend it because you create a feeling of ownership and responsibility with employees when you do it. So we are moving to our next question. Next we have uh, agile looks great 
how to make teams self organized yes if teams are not used to self organizing uh, they need a little help and you can do this by gradually um, moving more and more responsibility to the teams there is an exercise that i do and it's also part of the management 3.0 training which is a, an agile leadership training that i'm also giving uh, it's called delegation poker so it's a quite fun game that we are playing to decide on the right level of delegation and for what kind of key decisions are we applying this level of delegation and then you work to move more and more and more responsibility to the teams because you can't really expect um, an, a very formal non-self-organized team to suddenly become self-organizing uh, that's right you need to move gradually there are some tools you can use for that and, and delegation poker is one such tool okay so we are moving to our uh, next question maybe the last question we are taking in this session so mm -hmm. you have uh, organizations are still with mindset of shareholder values change to culture of value to customer to be at enterprise level is a bigger change without that change how the agile in hr will help overall enterprise agility yes that's the difficult nut to crack but hr is responsible for leadership programs so hr can decide what are the programs that we put in place for our managers in the organization and if they choose an agile leadership program leaders will start understanding uh, what the value structure should be like and the mindset so that will also be a very gradual change because of course in the beginning in a large company it's really really difficult to change managers mindset and leaders mindset because they may have been working for 30 years in the same way and they are they are used to that let's say and they have a lot to they think they have a lot to lose by going agile but really they don't they have only things to gain by going agile so um, I think HR can do a lot, uh, having that power. Okay, okay. So uh, we have come to the end of the session. So thanks, Pia Maria, for this wonderful session. We are already getting positive feedbacks. It was very helpful for many of our uh, participants. Great. We yeah. had very thankful also that that I could do this with you. Really happy. And uh, please contact me if you have other questions or if you want to attend one of my trainings. Uh, thank you very much, Piali. It was a pleasure having you with us, Pia Maria. And thank you all for joining us this evening. Attending this session, we learn you one SEO under category A and one leadership PDU. You will get an email with all the steps of claiming uh, that SEU and PDU in next one hour of time. If you have any follow-up query, as Pia Maria said, uh, you can connect her directly or you can uh, post your queries on our discussion forum. The link of the forum, you will get in the same email, uh, the SEU and PDU one. So yeah, that's all from my side. In case you want to add anything as a closing note, Pia Maria. No, I just thank you very much and have a great day uh, or evening for you in uh, India. For me, it's uh, it's just afternoon <laughs> here in Sweden. Okay. A great afternoon. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Pia Maria, and thank you all for joining. Bye. Bye. Bye.